Hey there, welcome back to my channel. I'm Cybersecurity Meg and I'm super stoked that you're here. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a topic that I'm really passionate about. As some of you probably already know, I work in my daily life as a cybersecurity incident response manager. And since I've begun this channel, one thing that I've really noticed or become aware of is a lot of people don't fully understand what exactly incident response is and how it differentiates from the field of cybersecurity in general or from simply being in a SOC and monitoring events. So throughout this video, I'm going to talk to you about what exactly incident response is, what could constitute an incident, the difference between an event and an incident, and probably I'll sprinkle in some information about what I do as an incident response manager. So one of the first and foremost things to address is what exactly could constitute an incident. Obviously, this is different contingent upon which company, which government, which organization you're working for, but by and large, an incident is anything that could adversely affect the CIA triad. And if you're not familiar with what exactly the CIA triad is, that's going to stand for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Three of what are namely the most important objectives of working in cybersecurity. The difference between an event and an incident. This is a question that I've gotten asked a lot on my channel, or really people want to know what exactly is different between incident response and just being a security analyst. And if you've watched my video about my time working as a cybersecurity analyst, you have an idea of what I spent my personal time doing as a cybersecurity analyst, but this is going to be different, again, obviously, where you're working or what exactly you're doing in your role. So the large difference between a security analyst and incident response is a lot of times security analysts or SOC analysts, they could be different, they are ingesting a very large amount of data, whether they're looking at a SIM, going through a SOAR, going through alerts that are coming from all of their security appliances, all of these alerts, these are going to be events. An event is simply just what is being produced from your security appliance, and it hasn't been analyzed or vetted yet. So it could be a false positive, it could be a false negative, you're not really sure until you analyze it. Generally, the main difference between an event and an incident is that an event is going to be analyzed and it can turn into an incident. So at what point does an event become an incident? Usually, like I said, this is when you're having something that's going to adversely affect the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your organization. And that's when you kind of initiate the incident response protocol. So then you're probably like, Meg, well, what exactly is an incident response protocol? And I'm going to do an entire series on incident response because I find it so fascinating and there's so much to talk about. And frankly, it's becoming more and more important as more breaches happen and cybersecurity is obviously trending and with COVID and everyone working from home. But nonetheless, I digress. I'll save that for another video. The point here is to give you a little bit more information about an introduction to incident response. So at the point that maybe a tier one analyst receives an event from a SIM, they're obviously going to do an investigation. Why did your SIM or why did your security appliance alert on this specific event? Why is it having you review it, analyze it, or investigate it? Obviously, the analyst is going to determine with the resources they have if they think that event is a true positive and if it's going to have any damage to the company. What's the severity of the event? What's the impact going to be? Is there going to be financial risk involved? Is there going to be reputational risk involved? What is going to be the effect of this event occurring? Again, contingent upon where you're working, you take all these factors into mind, the possible financial costs, reputational risk, all of the above, and that's when you determine if something should be an incident or not. Generally, once you determine if something's going to be an incident, you're going to initiate a CERT team. And that could be a CIRT, which is a computer incident response team, or you can also have what's called an SIRT, a security incident response team. There's also a CCERT, a computer security incident response team. And generally, they're pretty similar in their purpose. And the goal of incident response 
the final end goal of incident response is to restore a system or an issue to its previous state where it's fully functioning before running into whatever incident occurred. So you want to get things back to normal. You want to get whatever was in production beforehand and functioning properly back to where it was before the incident occurred. So then you kind of have to sit there and think, Incident response is from detection of the event, determining it's an incident, and getting all the way through to remediating the incident, as well as getting things back to how they were before, and importantly, very importantly, ensuring that you're putting the proper controls and measures into place that are going to prevent this incident from reoccurring again in the future. So what happens all in between? Well, a lot of things happen in between. <laughs> it all depends what kind of incident you're working. Is it a fraud incident? Is it a data breach? Was an SAP system breached? What happened? Generally, when an incident is qualified, because you always want to make sure to qualify an incident, this is a large step. You don't want to expend your resources, time, finances, and effort working on something only to find out that it is a false positive. And then you've spent all this time, you've cried wolf, you've gotten all these resources from different teams, and then you're like, well, heck, this is this is not an incident. That's not good. And frankly, that quickly diminishes the credibility and the value of your security incident response team. So you really want to make sure that when you're enacting a security incident response team, that you are doing so because there is an actual threat or some vulnerability has been exploited and there's a legitimate incident, right? So once your security incident response team has confirmed that there is in fact an incident, there are many steps that occur, but namely what you're going to be doing is you're going to be trying to document everything, acquire all the evidence that you can. Um, this is especially pertinent if any litigation in court is going to occur. So you always want to make sure that whatever anyone who's related to the incident is doing is documented, they're providing evidence, they're marking down time times, locations, IP addresses, who's putting their hands on the system, when was the system touched, any and all information that could be pertinent to the investigation or helping you to rebuild a timeline of what occurred in the incident. That's generally one of the first and foremost things. Um, also, there's always this argument between do you start documenting and collecting evidence first or is it more important to contain an incident first? Really depending on who you talk to or which framework you're looking at because there are many frameworks which govern how to do incident response, whether you're looking at NIST or SANS or whoever, they all have ideals on how things should occur. This is a very large debate in the community. Containment generally, I mean this is pretty obvious, you're containing the incident. You're ensuring that if there's malware, it's not spreading to the network. You're pulling out the, you're pulling out the cables, you're doing whatever, right? I'm not saying you should pull out cables. I'm not advocating for that whatsoever. I'm just trying to give hypothetical examples here. Um, so containing, you're stopping the spread, you're minimizing the impact, you're making sure that that event, excuse me, that incident stays isolated to the machine or to the user or to the application that the incident occurred on. So generally, once you've contained this is where you want to mitigate. You want to mitigate the effects of what has happened. So you're looking to reduce the impact of it, right? And generally when you're going through this process of identifying an incident all the way to getting things back to how they were before, you aren't going to be able to perfectly stick to this pattern or to this workflow or framework that's set out before you. Um, unfortunately, even for the most mature security incident response teams, you can see that people will hop all over the place. They may go from containing and then they're documenting and then they're also working with other teams to to discuss remediation. Frankly, security incident response is a very active, very um, lively, engaging, and quick-paced career or, you know, um, process to be going through. So this is not by any means like a strict formula that you have to go through. These are just kind of the general basic things that people experience when reacting to an incident. 
So once you've contained and you're mitigating um, and you're always documenting, like I mentioned, documentation is huge throughout this entire process. You're going to, at some point, decide, does this incident need to be reported? Do you need to report to a, um, a data authority? Did you have a GDPR breach? Do you only have 72 hours where you need to report to the appropriate authorities about some data breach? Do you need to involve the FBI? Do you need to get your local police involved? This is going to be a decision that's going to be made generally by the your CISO, your higher level senior management, your incident response management team, and those individuals. So once you've contained, mitigated, you're deciding on reporting, of course you're going to want to consider how do you get things back to putting them back to how they were before, right? So you want to restore functionality, um, but you want to make sure when you're restoring things that you're not putting the environment back into a vulnerable state that's susceptible to being exploited again, right? Because then that would completely defeat the purpose of the incident response process to just simply go back and put something exactly how you found it. It's, it defeats the process. Don't be that person. So, of course, this kind of brings into question, what can you do to prevent the incident from reoccurring? You generally might break this down into several different factors. What can you do in the short term? What do you have the resources for right then and there that you can do to fix it and keep it from reoccurring? That might be something that you can do within a few weeks of time. You also want to consider your medium and your long term kind of um, steps to prevent reoccurrence. So what can you do in the next few months? Maybe you need to buy something. What can you do in the next six months to a year plus is your long term actions. And generally those might require, you know, purchasing a new tool or hiring someone new onto your team. Those kind of things that take more resources, more time. So once you're determining exactly how you can prevent something from reoccurring, obviously you're wanting to restore things to pre-incident what happens. Um, you obviously wanna make the system or the application, whatever occurred, more secure than it was when the incident happened. That's the whole point of it, right? So once you're able to restore to where you were before, or ideally obviously being more secure and preventing the incident from reoccurring, you generally, if you're experiencing an incident that's large enough, are going to have a post-mortem discussion. You're gonna talk about why did the incident happen? What failed? How could the team who responded, the SIR or any of your IT or your business personnel, how can you do better? What can you fix for next time? Um, could your communication improve? Could you have handled communication outside of your organization improved? Generally, you're just going to be discussing things that you could do better, things that can prevent um, overall similar incidents from reoccurring, and you're, and you're analyzing how you responded to the incidents. You're probably going to find that there are many things that you can do to improve, and this might involve editing or updating some of your policies or standards you're really going to want to take this into account um, in your kind of post-mortem analysis, your incident response analysis, because it's always about constant improvement with incident response. The point of incident response would be nullified. It would be completely worthless if you weren't constantly improving yourselves to make sure that the incident doesn't reoccur again. So that's kind of a bit of a very broad and very general overview of an incident response process. Of course, this can get much more detailed. And like I mentioned, there are many frameworks that outline how theoretically this should happen. But I wanted to kind of provide you why that incident response is different than perhaps just being a SOC or security analyst, right? So a normal SOC or security analyst, which again, I recognize they can be different things to two, they're going to be evaluating events. Um, is this, you know, not every phishing email is going to be an incident. Sure, a phishing email where someone gives their passwords and you don't have two-factor authentication on and the user inputs their credentials to the network work and it's just a whole mess with that, certainly this could turn into an incident. But rather often than not, you'll probably see, hopefully, a small amount of events turning into incidents that are actually going to adversely affect the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your company, government, what have you. 
So that's where incident response and SOC kind of differentiate. There's a pretty big gap between, like I mentioned, you don't just want to have your SOC analysts. Um, I mean, it also depends if you have a tier one, tier two, tier three kind of ordeal, right? If you are a smaller company and you just have one person who's dedicated to security and they're reviewing all of the events and also doing incident response themselves, that's completely plausible and totally normal, right? Um, obviously, if you're working in a much larger, larger excuse me, organization, you're probably going to have various levels of personnel. And that's to say, perhaps your tier one team is monitoring events and if they see something suspicious that they don't know how to qualify, they may escalate it to tier two, who will then confirm an event, excuse me, confirm an incident, and then maybe tier two um, will initiate incident response or they will pass off the incident handling to someone who has a bit more subject matter expertise in the area of the incident. So those are some of the basics of general incident response overview and how incident response and everyday uh, SEC analysts or SOC analyst tasks differ. So my job as a cybersecurity incident response manager is to oversee the process, policies, standards, all of that, and it's just so intriguing. I think it's the best area of cybersecurity to be working in. I think it's an area of cybersecurity that's only going to be growing because as you know, whenever you turn on the news nowadays, you're constantly seeing another breach, uh, another data leak, another exfiltration, an application um, has been taken over or used to host some malicious content. Every day you're seeing something in the news. So frankly, the incident response train is going fast and um, it's good to be on it. That said, I do want to clarify, uh, there are two generally recognized forms or of incident response. So you can have incident response internal to an organization. That's to say that an organization has their own incident response team that they would activate when an incident occurs, or you can have what's called an incident response retainer or commonly known as an IRR. And these are when companies, perhaps they don't have the resources internally to have an incident response team. They might contract out to another company who specializes and has professional services for handling, managing, mitigating incidents. It's very common also to have both for larger organizations. Um, you might have an internal incident response team, but you might experience an incident that's so large that your team internally can't handle it all by themselves, whether due to resources, tools, whatever. And so then you call upon your incident response retainer. The point of the incident response retainer is to, as it's called, always be on retainer services and to be there when needed. So they're going to be there when for lack of a better word, shit hits the ceiling and you need help. I hope you found this discussion a little bit enlightening. I wanted to clarify a bit on incident response, kind of what it entails. I want to do a whole series on this because I think it's a really fascinating topic and a lot of people who have inquired about it and they're interested in it. So if you have any questions about it or any specific topics you'd like me to cover in future incident response videos, I'd be really happy to do so. Feel free to engage with me, ask me any questions. I'd love to help you or discuss incident or any, anything really with you. So yeah, let me know down below, DM me, whatever. Let's talk. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Happy Thanksgiving if you're in the US. And that's it for now. Ciao.